Be sure to check out one of ParCast's other great podcasts, Unexplained Mysteries. Every week, our friends Molly and Richard dig deep to uncover the world's greatest mysteries. This week, they continue their discussion on Easter Island, an isolated spot in the Pacific Ocean that's closest neighbor is over 1,000 miles away. How did these ancient people arrive in such a remote place? Why did they construct the now iconic Moai heads? And how did they transport these enormous statues across the island? Find out the answers this Thursday. Listen to Unexplained Mysteries wherever you find podcasts. Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of graphic material that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. From 1994 to 1997, Joseph DiMambro and Luke Jure convinced 74 members of the Order of the Solar Temple to set themselves on fire. But unlike a lot of cult leaders who knowingly tricked followers into believing outlandish lies, Joseph and Luke stood by their own principles and died in the fires with their followers. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. Today we're going to take a deep dive into the Order of the Solar Temple, which started out as a class to help students find connections between science and spirituality. But this harmless class evolved into a cult associated with fraud, money laundering, arms dealing, and mass suicide. According to Joseph's and Luke's teachings, The Order of the Solar Temple was a revival of the Knights Templar, an ancient order of Catholic knights endorsed by the Pope in 1139. Joseph's and Luke's primary aim was to unlock the secrets of the spiritual world through science. They believed that they were following in the footsteps of the original knights in their pursuit of universal truths. They also believed that the Earth would face a worldwide catastrophe in the mid-1990s, In 1994, the members decided that it was necessary to ascend to a higher spiritual plane to avoid the apocalypse. On October 4, 1994, 53 cult members gathered together in buildings that they set on fire, burning to death together. One year later, 16 more members self-immolated. In March of 1997, five more committed suicide in the same manner. According to their beliefs, committing suicide freed them from their existence on Earth and allowed them to start a new life on a planet orbiting the dog star, Sirius. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on your favorite podcast directory or on our website, parcast.com. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there, because a new episode comes out every Tuesday. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast, and on Twitter at Parcast Network. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. In part one of our two-part series on the Order of the Solar Temple, we'll focus on the cult's notorious leaders, Joseph D. Mambro and Luc Jure. While Luc acted as the cult's primary recruiter, Joseph led 74 people to commit suicide and ordered the death of a Swiss couple and son because he believed that their baby boy was the Antichrist. Joseph started out as a follower of a harmless religious movement, and Luke was originally a communist extremist and a passionate believer in homeopathic medicine. But the duo combined forces to form a rigid cult, with headquarters in France and Canada, that allowed them to decide who their 442 followers had sex with, when they had children, what they named those children, and even whether those followers lived or died. In part two, we'll investigate the circumstances that led to the cult's mass suicide over the course of three years from 1994 through 1997, which claimed the lives of 74 men and women in total, including both cult leaders. 
This three-year mass suicide process is unusual for a cult and shows the deep level of commitment of the cult's followers, a commitment that continued even after their leaders had died. To understand why the members of a seemingly benign religious movement committed suicide, we have to start with Joseph DiMambro, the leader most instrumental in pushing the group's members to self-immolate. Unfortunately, little is known about Joseph de Mambro's early life. Like most cult leaders, Joseph was careful to control how he was perceived by his followers. He hid any information about his life from the general public that would contradict his pronouncement that he was a powerful mystical being. But we do know a few things about his early life. We know that he was born on August 19, 1924, in Pont-Saint-Esprit, France, that he was a jeweler by trade, and that he had a son named Ellie and a daughter named Emmanuel, both of whom he claimed were conceived through theogamy. He claimed neither child had a human mother. Theogamy refers to the process through which a human being and a supernatural entity join together in a sexual or marital union. A more familiar example of this is in the Bible, when the Virgin Mary conceives Jesus out of a pure, non-sexual union with God. Vanessa is going to take over the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Those of you who have listened to our episodes may recognize Joseph's claim that he fathered divine children as an example of mystical manipulation, a term coined by renowned cult psychologist Dr. Robert J. Lifton. Mystical manipulation refers to coincidences that are engineered to make it seem like they're evidence of mystical events. In this case, Joseph used the existence of his children as proof that he had a connection to the divine. Wouldn't this be very easily disproven? I'm sure the kids' birth certificates would have documented the name of their mother. Probably. Joseph's lies weren't exactly airtight. True. And Joseph also was known for making extravagant claims about his abilities. Joseph and his followers said they were able to conjure up images of mystical beings, cure people of cancer by touch, and exclusively possess secret truths about the universe. Clearly, Joseph's insistence that he caused his children to appear out of thin air wasn't the most outrageous claim he made. Joseph started out as a follower of a new religious movement himself. A new religious movement refers to any religious or spiritual group originating in modern day. From 1956 through the 1960s, he followed the Rosicrucian order. Rosicrucianism is a worldwide brotherhood that claims to uniquely possess the secret teachings of Christian Rosenkreutz. Christian Rosenkreutz was allegedly born in 1378 and lived for 106 years. According to Rosicrucianism, Christian traveled through North Africa and the Middle East in search of secret wisdom. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly what secret wisdom he allegedly found and taught others because the group keeps a tight lid on that information. This is what makes it difficult to investigate these esoteric secret religious movements. The secret wisdom is kept secret. Although Christian Rosenkreutz is considered by most mainstream academics to be a fictional figure, Rosicrucians believe that he existed as they come to study his teachings today. Even though the existence of its founder is suspect, Rosicrucianism has been a mostly harmless movement, distinguished by its followers' desire to uncover the truths about the universe. Many prominent figures throughout history have been members of Rosicrucianism, including Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, and René Descartes. Different followers practiced the Rosicrucian way of life differently. Isaac Newton's interest was in alchemy. He believed that the purification of metals mirrored the purification of a person's life through death and destruction. Like many Rosicrucians, as well as members of the Newton believed that the study of science could eventually unlock the secrets of spirituality. In contrast, Descartes was more interested in the study of medicine and the lengthening of human life. He didn't consider magic and the mystical world to be worthy of his time. 
But like many other Rosicrucians, he was devoted to unlocking the secrets of the universe. It seems strange that Joseph, a follower of a benign movement like Rosicrucianism, would later end up causing the deaths of so many people. It actually isn't as surprising as you think. It's rare for any two people of the same religion to worship in the same exact way. Just as Newton and Descartes practiced Rosicrucianism differently, Joseph had his own way of interpreting Rosicrucian teachings. His form of religious observance enabled his money laundering schemes and drove him towards a fiery end. Joseph left the Rosicrucian order in the late 60s. The reasons behind his departure are unknown. What we do know is that Joseph conducted an unlicensed practice as a psychologist after leaving Rosicrucianism. Although his practice was highly successful, he was eventually found out and charged with fraud. In 1970, Joseph left France and fled to Switzerland in order to avoid the fraud charges. Joseph's ability to operate as a psychologist, despite his lack of training, showed how good he was at getting people to trust him. This would later become an ability that was essential for him to manipulate his followers. But leaving the Rosicrucian order didn't mean Joseph was done with new religious movements altogether. After leaving Rosicrucianism, Joseph joined the Argeny movement in the 1970s. Established by Jacques Breyer, Argeny was also meant to be a revival of the Templar Knights. According to Jacques, he established the Argeny movement after he discovered an 18th century document in Paris, which supposedly stated that lost Templar relics could be found on his family estate. To give some historical background, the Templar Knights were an elite order of knights in the Crusades, distinguished by the red crosses on their uniforms. They originated around 1118, when Nocera de Pagani gathered a group of eight knights to protect pilgrims on their journey to Israel. They were legitimized by King Baldwin II of Jerusalem, who allowed them to set up their headquarters on the Temple Mount, a location sacred to Christians and Jews for being the original site of the Temple of King Solomon. But Jacques Breyer believed that Argeny was also a crucial location for the original Templar Knights. He claimed that Nocera de Pagani and his eight knights actually founded the Order of the Temple in Argeny on June 12, 1118, and left behind holy relics. Despite the fact that Breyer was never able to prove the existence of the lost relics, he managed to gain a following of people. Joseph became one of Breyer's devoted followers and believed Breyer when he said that the imminent destruction of mankind was near and that only through Breyer's teachings could people escape safely. Breyer's teachings consisted of analyzing cosmic charts to unlock the secrets of the universe and prepare for the impending apocalypse. This doomsday element of the Argeny movement may have inspired Joseph to eventually center the order of the solar temple around the apocalypse. Joseph would later tell his followers that the earth was ending, and in preparation for the end of days, they needed to stockpile food, weapons, and ammunition before the earth was destroyed by volcanoes. Here's something we want you to check out. If you're looking for home security, let me tell you why I'm a huge fan of Simply Safe. It's ready for anything that gets thrown at it. Whether a storm takes out your power or an intruder cuts your phone line, Simply Safe is ready. Even if your keypad or siren gets destroyed, Simply Safe will still get you the help you need. Simply Safe is always ready, even for the worst case scenario. That's what makes it great. You might think that Simply Safe would cost a fortune, and it should, but it doesn't. They charge you what's fair, $14.99 a month, and there are no contracts and no hidden fees. I recommend Simply Safe to everyone I know. You've got to check it out. Go today to simplysafe.com slash cults. That's S-I-M-P-L-I-S-A-F-E dot com slash cults. And here's another podcast favorite. Keeping your hair color vibrant and fresh is difficult. It can take hours to do in a salon, and the store-bought boxed color either smells awful or has harsh ingredients. 
That's why Amy Arrett, founder of Madison Reed, believes women deserve better than expensive, time-consuming salon visits and harmful box dyes. Madison Reed is revolutionizing the way women color their hair. Madison Reed dyes are salon quality, but also affordable. In fact, you can get their beautiful, multi-dimensional hair color delivered to your door for less than $25. That sounds way more convenient than spending hours at a salon. Mm -hmm. Join the hundreds of thousands of women who have tried and loved Madison Reed. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. Madison Reed would like to honor Cults listeners with 10% off, plus free shipping on their first color kit with promo code CULTS. That's madison-reed.com, promo code CULTS. Now, let's get back to the story. In 1978, Joseph de Mambro established the Golden Way in Geneva, Switzerland. This organization was open to the public and was a way for people to acquaint themselves with modern Templarism, the practice of following the principles of the Templar Knights. Initially, Golden Way did not have many members. The exact number of members is unknown, but former members have said that the group was small enough that all the members were able to live together in one communal house in France. Joseph led his members through esoteric ceremonies, which would have looked silly from an outsider's perspective. In these ceremonies, Joseph dressed up in a glittery gold cape, setting up images of red crosses to symbolize the Templars, and conjured mystical images of the Ascended Masters, which are actually holograms projected by one of his followers, Tony Dutois. But despite Joseph's ability to lead a small group of followers, he wasn't able to attract large numbers of members to his cult. It wasn't until he met Luc Jure that he was able to become a truly effective cult leader. 23 years after Joseph's birth, Luc Jure, co-founder of the Order of the Solar Temple, was born in Kikwit, Belgian Congo, on October 18, 1947. While Joseph studied Rosicrucianism through the 1960s, Luc was in college. He soon formed the Parti Communautaire European with Jean-Francois Thiriard, a known neo-Nazi. The group started out as a branch of the Communist Party in France until Luke engineered a split, which allowed them to develop their own core membership in the 70s. The group was set apart by its anti-Semitism. Its members claimed that they needed to free Europe from the influence of both the United States and the Jewish people. The group consisted of members from the far right as well as the far left, including neo-fascists and Maoists. This was Luke's first time leading an anti-establishment movement and served as an essential stepping stone for Luke on his path to becoming the leader of the Order of the Solar Temple. Luke Charest graduated from the Free University in Brussels and earned his medical degree in 1974. Two years later, in 1976, Luke joined the paratroopers of the Belgian army. According to a friend of Luke's who served with him, Luke's reason for joining the military was idealistic. Luke believed that he could infiltrate the military and spread communist ideas. Soon after joining, Luke's battalion was sent to rescue European civilians who were caught up in the crossfire of the conflict. This was far more than Luke had bargained for. He left the army shortly afterward and focused on studying homeopathic medicine from the late 70s through the early 80s. During his studies, Luke traveled the world. He spent a lot of his time in the Philippines to continue his study of homeopathic treatments. His desire to tie medicine to spirituality echoed Rosicrucian teachings, which would eventually make Joseph's golden way look very appealing to him. Luke's research on homeopathic medicine made him a popular lecturer on the subject. Although Luke considered spirituality to be an important aspect of medicine, he did not focus on mysticism in his lectures. He cleverly made sure that his ideas were solidly grounded in science so that they would be accessible and palatable to newcomers. Meanwhile, by 1983, Joseph's Golden Way organization had been in operation for five years. Luke's lectures attracted a wide audience and drew Joseph's attention. In the same year, Joseph invited Luke to lecture for the Golden Way. The pair connected immediately because of their similar views on science and spirituality. 
Also in the same year, Joseph introduced Luke to Julien Origas, the leader of the renovated Order of the Temple, another Templar organization. Julian, a neo-Nazi, got along well with Luke, who was used to working alongside neo-Nazis after running the Parti Communitaire European. After Luke joined the renovated Order of the Temple, Julian passed away in 1983. Luke seized this opportunity to take control of the organization, but faced heavy opposition from Julian's daughter, Catherine Origas, who, along with a number of other members, forced Luke to leave the order. Luckily for Luke, the timing couldn't be better because Joseph was eager to join forces with him. Joseph lacked Luke's education and people skills, and he realized that he needed Luke's help to attract more people to his cult. This also allowed Luke to save face. By joining Joseph's group, Luke could claim that he was not forced out of the renovated order of the temple. Rather, it was the will of the Ascended Masters that caused him to leave that group willingly to form a new group with Joseph. By combining Joseph's shrewdness with Luke's charisma and knowledge of medicine, the two men created the Order of the Solar Temple in 1984. Their initial goal was to unlock the secret knowledge of the universe. Little did they know their journey toward the truth would eventually lead to their deaths. But for now, their partnership was successful. Luke's lectures drew in more followers than Joseph could have brought in on his own. The Order of the Solar Temple now consisted of ex-members of the renovated Order of the Temple, homeopathic patients of Luke Jure, and people who were drawn into the cult through Luke's lectures. Both men had their own specialties in the organization. Joseph was in charge of finances and worked behind the scenes, while Luke was the face of the cult and worked to recruit new members. The teachings of the Order of the Solar Temple were based on a combination of Rosicrucianism, Argeny Templarism, and Theosophy. Theosophy was founded in 1875 by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, Henry Steele Alcott, and William Q. Judge. It was a religion established to explore the unexplained laws of nature through the study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science. Theosophy was heavily influenced by Hinduism, Buddhism, and ancient Egyptian religion, none of which were well known in Europe at the time of Theosophy's founding, and therefore seemed like fresh concepts to many Europeans. One distinctive characteristic of Theosophy is its belief in the Ascended Masters, enlightened beings who had freed themselves from the cycle of death and rebirth, but who continued to guide humankind. Ascended Masters included figures from all religions, such as Abraham, Moses, Solomon, Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, Confucius, Lao Tzu, and the Buddha. These masters featured prominently in the Order of the Solar Temple. Theosophy also lent another important concept to the Order of the Solar Temple, the importance of the star Sirius. According to Theosophy, Sirius was where all human consciousness originated. Sirius's main function in the universe was to transmit energy to all the minds of humans to create their sense of self. Between 1984 and 1990, the Solar Temple served as an umbrella organization for three different groups, the Amanta Club, the Arcadia Club, and the International Knighthood Organization. Between them, the groups had over 350 members. The Amanta Club went further into depth on the group's philosophy with the goal of achieving a higher state of consciousness. Very few people were invited to be part of this group. The Arcadia Club was reserved for a small number of Amanta members who were deemed worthy of receiving more esoteric information that would allow them to move towards a higher level of consciousness. Above the Arcadia Group was the International Knighthood Organization. These members were invited from the Arcadia Club and participated in their own initiation ceremonies. At this point, the Order of the Solar Temple was not a destructive cult. According to cult psychologist Dr. Robert Lifton, the eight criteria for classifying a destructive cult include milieu control, mystical manipulation, a demand for purity, 
confession, sacred science, loading the language, doctrine over person, and dispensing of existence. Well, Joseph's claims that his children were the result of theogamy was definitely mystical manipulation. Yes, that's one of eight. But let's take a look at milieu control, which refers to the way destructive cult leaders isolate followers from society at large. The followers of the Order of the Solar Temple were never separated from the rest of the world. The general public was permitted to attend lectures by Luke, who taught the principles of the cult. Right up until the mass suicide, members had access to the mainstream media and were aware of all the critiques that outsiders had about their organization. The next criteria for a destructive cult is demand for purity, which refers to a situation in which the organization encourages its followers to see in black and white and celebrate orthodoxy or a level observance in which rules are adhered to and followed as literally as possible. Interestingly enough, not all organizations that celebrate strict adherence to the principles are cults, or even destructive. Many branches of mainstream religions, such as Evangelical Christianity, Orthodox Judaism, or Conservative Islam, encourage members to observe customs as closely as possible, and interpret texts as literally as possible. Yet they are not destructive organizations. The Order of the Solar Temple did not encourage a rigid adherence to religious doctrine. As a matter of fact, the group continually changed its beliefs and its method of practice. Even its name and basic structure evolved over the course of its existence. Just like its predecessor, Rosicrucianism, the Order of the Solar Temple permitted its followers to worship in different ways as the individual saw fit. So now we're one for eight in terms of destructive qualities. At this point, it's not easy to tell how the Order of the Solar Temple transformed into a suicidal cult. Even Professor James Lewis, who spent a large period of time studying the organization from within its innermost circles, mentions in his book that the Order of the Solar Temple was one of the last organizations he would have ever thought would turn violent. Another element of many destructive cults is confession, in which members are forced to confess sins so that they can be exploited by the organization's leaders. An element which was also missing from the Order of the Solar Temple. That leads us to the next attribute of destructive cults, according to Lifton, sacred science. Sacred science is when an organization implies that its doctrine or ideology is the ultimate truth and that the leader is a spokesperson for God and therefore above all scrutiny. Joseph certainly made use of sacred science. He claimed to his followers that he was simultaneously a reincarnation of a 14th century Templar knight, one of the Egyptian pharaohs, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and the Roman soldier who pierced Jesus on the cross. Even if we accepted Joseph's insistence that he was reincarnated, his story was still far-fetched, since the Roman soldier who stabbed Jesus and Jesus' apostles existed at the same time, it didn't make any logical sense that Joseph could have possibly been both people. Joseph also claimed that his daughter Emmanuel was a cosmic child of spiritual importance. What it meant to be a cosmic child was never explained to people within the inner circles of the organization. But Joseph made it clear that Emmanuel was to be treated with the utmost reverence. Joseph additionally claimed that only he had access to the ascended masters, who were the ultimate spiritual authority. All of Joseph's claims fall into the realm of sacred science. Luke, on the other hand, justified his position as the leader by claiming that he was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ himself and St. Bernard of Clairvaux, the founder of the Knights Templar. Luke also claimed to have supernatural healing abilities. One ex-member even reported that when he first met Luke, Luke said to him about a minor ailment, quote, it's luck you came to me when you did. You had cancer, and I just cured it." End quote. Lifton's next criteria is loading the language, in which esoteric phrases or words are used so that outsiders are unable to understand cult members. This often includes thought-terminating cliches meant to help members conform to the group's way of thinking. 
The Order of the Solar Temple was known for being esoteric with its teachings. Many of its most important doctrines were not shared with the general public. This makes it very difficult for us to study the group's beliefs, since the leaders who taught those doctrines are now dead. However, what we do know is that the organization made sure that the members believed that they had special knowledge that made their understanding of the world superior to outsiders. This made it easy for the leaders to manipulate their followers. The next criteria is doctrine over person. This refers to when a cult forces members to deny their own personal experiences or thoughts to fit the doctrines of the organization. Up until the mass suicide, the Order of the Solar Temple did not fit this criteria. Since Luke was perfectly willing to allow people with doubts about his teachings to attend his lectures and question him. The last criteria in Lifton's definition of a destructive cult is the dispensing of existence, in which people outside of the cult are considered inferior to those within the cult, and therefore their lives are not valued. This is one major way in which the Order of the Solar Temple differed from other destructive cults. Many other cults are known for violence against outsiders or defectors. However, it's important to note that the members who participated in the mass suicide belonged to the cult's innermost circles. Members of the Order of the Solar Temple never harmed people outside the cult. So it seems like the Order of the Solar Temple initially only fulfilled three of the eight criteria for being classified as a destructive cult, including loading the language, sacred science, and mystical manipulation. Which means that it originally wasn't very different from a lot of mainstream religions. So were there any warning signs that the Order of the Solar Temple posed a danger to its members? Joseph definitely had a manipulative streak. To fund the organization, Joseph had members pay hefty amounts to ascend to higher levels in the organizations. The cult generally focused on recruiting affluent people around the world who would be better equipped to support the cult financially. So the cult was established for Joseph's and Luke's financial gain. I think that monetary gain was definitely one of their goals. But remember that Joseph and Luke were eventually willing to die alongside their followers for their beliefs. This implies that they weren't simply using the cult to make money. To some degree, they must have believed what they preached. When the cult was founded in 1983, it was very different from the suicide cult that it became later. There was no apparent intention at all to conduct mass suicides to transcend to a higher level of existence. At this point, the cult had more of a survivalist mentality. They even set up a farm in Quebec meant to be an Ark of Refuge, in which survivors of the apocalypse could survive off subsistence farming. This also served as a second location in addition to their headquarters in France. By 1989, membership in all these subgroups grew until membership peaked at 442 members. But it was at this point where things began to take a turn for the worse. In the 1990s, many members began to question Joseph de Mambro's authority when they realized that while he asked followers to live humbly, he maintained a lavish lifestyle. He did this by asking members to make sizable donations for his own financial gain. Joseph was clearly transforming into a destructive cult leader. This got worse as Joseph began to desire more wealth. Joseph would constantly buy, flip, and sell the organization's properties in erratic ways. His actions caused many members of law enforcement to suspect to this day that Joseph was involved in money laundering. Joseph, of course, justified his actions by claiming that he was merely inspired by the Knights Templar, who, among other things, were known for establishing the first bank. He explained that the Knights often engaged in strange financial practices to protect their wealth, and therefore he was merely following in an ancient tradition. But even though legal charges were never brought against Joseph, many experts feel pretty certain that Joseph was involved in illegal activities. Also, in the 1990s, Joseph began to use milieu control. He insisted on having control over who the senior members married, when they had children, and what their children's names were. 
Joseph even claimed to have magical sex abilities and manipulated female cult members into having sex with him. In 1991, many French members decided to abandon their worldly possessions and move to the Order's second location in Canada. This mass relocation led to an investigation by Lucien Zeckler, the president of the Association for the Defense of Family and Individuals. In the same year, Zeckler wrote a letter to InfoCult, an organization known for providing support for people and their families who have been victimized by cults. In this letter, Zeckler expressed concern that the Order of the Solar Temple was using mind control to manipulate its members. In 1993, Luc Giray and two other Order of the Solar Temple members were arrested in Canada for attempting to illegally purchase three silenced firearms. Luc Giray's arrest was closely followed by the mainstream media, which brought the entire organization under close scrutiny. Purchasing illegal firearms was evidence that the Order of the Solar Temple was not only involved in money laundering, but also arms dealing. Suddenly, members began to feel betrayed. The organization had been presented to them as a way to uncover the ultimate truth. Now, there was evidence that the leaders were asking followers to give up their worldly possessions while living lavish lifestyles themselves. With criminal charges brought on their leaders, the members began to suffer from the consequences of being rejected by the surrounding community. For many, the pressure was too much, and they left the order in increasing numbers. Soon the cult whittled down to approximately a hundred members. Members were also bothered by how Luke and Joseph were starting to struggle against one another for control of the cult. It would seem that history was repeating itself for Luke. He was once again part of a cult that was trying to remove him from leadership. With Luke and Joseph unable to resolve their differences, the cult became less organized, which made it less appealing to even its most loyal members. Among the members to leave were Tony Dutois and his wife Suzanne Robinson. As mentioned previously, Dutois was the man who was responsible for producing the holograms that were so essential to Joseph's ceremonies. Dutois continued to work for Joseph and provide the technology necessary for Joseph to produce the illusions he needed. The departure of the Dutois was a heavy blow to the organization, so Joseph and the other members of the Order of the Solar Temple explored the only option they believed they had left. Shortly after the Dutois' departure on September 30th of 1994, Joseph declared their son Christopher Emmanuel Dutois to be the Antichrist. According to Joseph, the murder of Emmanuel was justified because his name, Emmanuel, was similar to Joseph's daughter's name, Emmanuel. Joseph said that the similarity indicated that the two children were tied to one another as rivals. This was a sign of Joseph's disturbing need to control his members. He was furious that the Dutois did not consult him when naming their baby and even more furious that they chose a name that was similar to the one that he gave his daughter. Joseph further insisted that since Emmanuel was the cosmic child, that meant Emmanuel had to be the Antichrist. On top of it all, Joseph said that since he was the reincarnation of the Roman soldier who pierced Jesus on the cross, he had no choice but to atone for his sin by killing the Antichrist. He persuaded his followers Joel Egger and Dominique Bellatin to kill Tony and Suzanne, put their child Emmanuel in a bag, and stab him to death with a wooden stake. The bodies of Tony and Suzanne were burned beyond recognition with that of their infant son. But this was only the first of Joseph's horrific crimes. Not satisfied with murdering three of his ex-followers, Joseph was about to increase the body count. Joseph initially taught his followers that an apocalypse was drawing near and that they needed to be prepared to survive the end of days. But this narrative was no longer working and the tale wasn't enough to keep his members committed to him. What was more, in his mind, he had bigger problems than Luke, his shrinking membership and the police. It was almost 1995 this was the year the world was destined to end in flames, but the order was not ready. 
Unwilling to die in the apocalypse, along with the rest of mankind, Joseph came up with an idea. According to the order of the solar temple, all human consciousness originated from energy projected from the dog star, Sirius, the same star where all the ascended masters lived, observing humankind from afar. The ascended masters, according to the order of the solar temple, did not have bodies. Bodies were unnecessary when your true self existed on Sirius. According to Joseph, the only way to live on Sirius alongside the masters was through ritualistic suicide. The most terrifying thing about this new development in their belief system was that it took away the value of human life on Earth. Now the curious group of people following in the footsteps of intellectual occultists like Leonardo da Vinci and Isaac Newton were gone. What replaced curiosity was a fear of the apocalypse and a dangerous hunger for immortality. With authorities closing in on Joseph and Luke, they had lost everything they had their influence, their wealth, the adoration of their members, and with the end of the world closing in, they were potentially about to lose their immortality. But they still had one thing left. They held the lives of their remaining members in the palm of their hands. To Joseph and Luke, there was only one course of action left to take with their remaining handful of members. They had to kill them all. Don't forget to check out the Unexplained Mysteries podcast. This week, Molly and Richard continue their discussion on Easter Island, an isolated spot of the Pacific Ocean that's closest neighbor is over 1,000 miles away. Find out how these ancient people arrived in such a remote place and how they constructed the now iconic Moai heads. Listen this Thursday to Unexplained Mysteries wherever you find podcasts. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Join us next week as we dive into part two of the Order of the Solar Temple. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Carrie Murphy, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire, Carly Madden, and Jeanette Manning. Cults is written by Joseph Yuen and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. 